So you're thinking of building a 486 retro gaming PC? Well, good luck to you. It's a rite of passage. The 486 is one of the most tricky retro platforms to work with. I recently bought this motherboard and in this video, well, you will learn just how tricky and how difficult such a board can be. So here we have the motherboard and look at that. It ticks most of the boxes that you want in a 486 main board. And this is the main reason why I got it. So we have ICA slots for our DOS compatible sound cards. We have PCI, that means we can use high performance video cards for yeah, excellent performance, but we're also getting a sharper image. Some of the ISA video cards, the output quality is not that great and finding VESA local bus video cards can be quite expensive, whereas PCI video cards are still reasonably affordable. Chipset from Acer, ALI, excellent performance and features. Look at that, we're getting onboard storage controllers. So we have two IDE channels here. Uh, floppy port goes there and then we've got headers for the parallel port this one here two com ports for serial interface and then a nice surprise this motherboard has a little header here for ps2 for a ps2 mouse and we are getting a coin cell battery this is what i'm after i avoid motherboards with barrel batteries because they usually leak and sometimes the sellers they're sneaky they did some repairs but you just never quite know what you're getting. This is the model number P405 revision 02. I found a data sheet on the Acer chipset and lots of interesting information we can see what sort of processes are supported Intel of course AMD but we also have mentioned Cyrix and UMC and over here Texas Instruments and in terms of memory it seems to even support EDO RAM and with the cache it does have support for level 1 right back cache as well so all in all this looks like a very decent chipset. For a 486, very important is having good documentation. Here we are on the retro web and look at that, the P405 motherboard has some information. We are clicking on documentation. There is a scanned user manual. We can see some features of the main board, but more important down here, the jumpers to configure whatever processor and cache size we have. And here we have a nice table you choose the CPU so in our case we've got the Cyrix DX4100 these are all the jumpers I've confirmed them they're all checking out and down here is some more information to do with the clock speeds and even more important are the cache configuration options here depending on how much level 2 cache you have installed you also need to change a few jumpers I took a photo of my motherboard and I've submitted it to this page as well as uploading the BIOS that came with my version. The main board came with a processor from IBM, it's the 486DX4 and if we look at the back, well, yeah, it's quite dirty and there was also one pin missing right here. I will. Uh, put a photo on the screen. The processor did work just fine. Now you might be wondering, well, did IBM really make CPUs? The design is from Cyrix and here we go. So I installed a Cyrix DX4. They perform identical, the design is the same, but Cyrix didn't have any fabs to manufacture processors. So they outsourced it to companies like IBM uh, or Texas instruments. So you will find a lot of these DX4100 CPUs and they're basically the same, they just have a different label. This is the memory the board came with, 4 megabytes of RAM. Now this motherboard uses 72 pin memory, so there's a 32 bit data bus, which means you only need one module to have a working system. 4 megabytes is a little bit on the low side, also the supported speed, 70 nano seconds so later I will upgrade this to 8 megabytes. This will unlock some benchmarks. Quake for example doesn't run with 4 megabytes and also Speedsys, a popular uh, utility 
also needs more than 4 megabytes of RAM. The motherboard came with a level 2 cache installed. This is something I always pay attention to when buying used parts. A lot of these sellers, they're a little bit sneaky. They remove these chips and sell them individually to make more money. I have upgraded the amount. Originally, it came with these chips here. It was configured with a total of 256 kilobytes of cache. These four chips, they are 32 pin and have a capacity of 512 kilobits each. And this is the tag chip. This is a 28 pin module and has a capacity of 256 kilobits of capacity. So now it's time to test the motherboard. I went over the documentation, made sure all the jumpers are configured correctly. And I was testing with an S3 Verge card. I don't remember exactly which model. And unfortunately, only the two first PCI slots were fully working. On the third and the fourth slot, I got some beep codes through the PC speaker. So I took a close look at the motherboard. I couldn't see any major scratches or corrosion going on, but then I spotted something interesting right here at this chipset. I will put some photos on the screen and it seems there was some damage and the seller or at least someone has done some repairs. And it seems that, yeah, some of these wires seem to be going to the PCI sockets. But at least the motherboard is working and two PCI slots. To be honest, that's all I need. So now let's test the machine a little bit in more detail. These are the parts I'm using. We've got the S3 Trio 64. This is a model from Diamond, the Stealth 64. I have upgraded the RAM as well. For storage, we're using the GoTech floppy emulator, very nifty device and worked beautifully with this project. And for the hard drive, we're using a replacement, converting SD cards to IDE. These adapters work really well for 386 and 486 machines. I used a 16 gigabyte uh, SanDisk card, but under DOS, the maximum you can use are two gigabyte partitions. And I am also upgrading the RAM. We have two four megabyte modules. These are a little bit faster. They've got a rating of 60 nanoseconds. It just ensures that we can use the fastest timings in the BIOS. We also need some adapters. This one converts from the AT keyboard adapter to PS2. So I was able to use a uh, not so vintage PS2 keyboard. And we also need one of these converting the AT power. So this side goes into the motherboard. Make sure the black wires are in the center. And then this connector here goes into a modern ATX power supply and you get a button to power on the machine. Unfortunately, things didn't look very good. I was able to boot DOS, install DOS, run some benchmarks, but the machine kept freezing, hard locking during some benchmarking. The machine was stable when using the BIOS defaults, but not with the setup defaults. So that means that one of the BIOS settings affecting performance is causing this machine to lock up. Over the holidays, I bought a new gadget, another programmer. This is the T48. It replaces the model that I had before. And yeah, so I finally had a project where I could use this gadget to flash the BIOS. Let's talk about the BIOS. So my main board came with this BIOS version. I did a search online. I found an older version here on the Retro Web webpage, as well as on Vogons. There's a user, he asked if anyone had a BIOS dump for this motherboard. And this user here, Fermo wrong, he delivered, he dumped and uploaded his BIOS. Here we are in a hex editor and I've loaded all three BIOS versions. These two are from the Retro Web and also Vogons. They are identical. There's a tool uh, analysis where you can compare the data. They are 100% identical. But this one is the BIOS version that mine came with. So it's quite different. And I got a nice surprise when I flashed the older BIOS versions. 
these use the AMI Win BIOS, which, yeah, with a mouse you get icons. It's quite impressive actually. Whereas mine is the more traditional uh, award BIOS. So when I submitted this BIOS version to the retro web, I put in the email that I'm not quite sure if it's legit because it's quite different, but I got a reply from Enrico and he confirmed they were aware of different BIOS types for this motherboard. So that is awesome. And I love these little nuggets of information. And yeah, so if you have this motherboard out there, you have a choice. You can go with the older wind BIOS version, which yeah, worked okay for me, but later in the video, yeah, we will come back to that. Or you can try the newer version from 1995, but here you don't get the wind BIOS. It's the traditional award BIOS layout. And to my surprise, with the older BIOS version, this is the one with the AMI Win BIOS, no more lockups. Now the optimized defaults, they don't use the fastest timings, so I manually configured the lowest latencies for the memory and for the cache, and yeah, the machine was stable. We can now run some benchmarks. Out of the box, I got a 3D Bench 1.0C result of 56.6 FPS. And then I did a bit of BIOS tweaking with the fastest timings. We have 3D Bench 59.6, the PC Player benchmark 15.6 FPS. The Doom benchmark runs at 2,331 ticks and Quake, we're getting 8.9 FPS. These results are from my benchmark pack that you can download from the Phil's Computer Lab website. You just launch it, press a few buttons, and it outputs the scores. So I compared these results to some of the entries in the VGA benchmark project that I launched many years ago. And the results that do check out fine, but they're a little bit on the slow side. So I ran the cache check utility, and this utility tells me, well, this machine does not have any level two cache. Remember these cache modules that the motherboard came with? So I used my chip programmer. It has a function to test static RAM and right away it detected that these are not working. None of the pins are uh, connected. So yeah, these are fake cache chips. That used to be a thing. Some of the sellers would put fake chips on these motherboards to charge a premium and make more money. So I needed some cache memory chips to continue with the project and then I ended up doing a side quest. My collection of memory chips, yeah, it wasn't really well documented and organized. So I identified all the modules, I tested them all and basically uh, categorized them into capacities. And now I could try out a few different memory configurations and see how it affects the performance. So I started with 128 kilobytes of level two cache. For the tag memory, we need a 64 kilobit chip with 28 pins. So I installed that one. And for the actual cache, we need four modules, 256 kilobits with 28 pins. I have a lot of these uh, modules with that capacity on hand. And yeah, everything worked fine, turning on the machine the 128 kilobyte of level two cache gets detected at post. Here we have the benchmark results. 3D Bench now 66.9, so that's a nice uptick. The PC player benchmark 16.1. Doom now runs with 2,257 ticks and Quake 9.1 FPS. So all in all, that's a nice upgrade in performance. Unfortunately, more issues when I tested the motherboard configured with 256 kilobytes and 512 kilobytes of level two cache. It just wouldn't post and I would get all sorts of weird issues. So I tried all sorts of things, even changing the CPU. So that's why we have a Cyrix here instead of the IBM. Maybe the CPU had some issues, but no, I was still getting the same issues. And then I tried even another CPU and Intel DX4, but that one also had issues with locking up during post. So as a last ditch effort, I used my BIOS programmer again, 
and I'm flashing the original more modern bias from 1995 back on the main board and I don't know why but for some reason yeah the cache modules the upgraded ones now are working. I went straight for the maximum capacity 512 kilobytes so we need four of these modules these are 32 pin with 1024 kilobits of storage and for the tag ram we need one of these guys 256 kilobits with 28 pins and here are the results now be aware this is with the intel dx4 i have results for you comparing with and without 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache so look at that 3d bench now 75.6 pc player benchmark 21.6 Doom runs at 1,693 ticks, so the lower, the faster, and Quake, 12.4. So guys, with the Intel DX4, the performance is outstanding. And this is the slower version with the write-through cache. There's a faster one that has the write-back cache. There's a different marking on the processor. But yeah, the benchmark results are fantastic. I had a look online comparing it with other Intel DX4 systems and this main board, yeah, it could be one of the fastest ones out there. I'm still a little bit skeptical about the reliability. Even after all the tweaks that I've shown in the video, I still got another lockup in Doom and I haven't been able to really narrow it down because yeah, I couldn't repeat it. But yeah, I hope you got uh, a sense of what working with a 486 can be like. Now, the beauty is once you have a machine up and running, there's so much you can do. There are processors running at 16, 20 or 25 megahertz if you're looking for something at the low end. And then at the high end, you can go 133 megahertz, but there are also uh, 686 CPUs from Cyrix and of course the Pentium Overdrive. So all in all, this is a very flexible platform. There's a lot more you can do with a 486 compared to a 386, for example. Now, also, I did have the option to return this motherboard and get my money back because, well, it wasn't hard to collect all the evidence, but I decided to keep it. We negotiated a slight reduction in pricing because well, reality is these boards are really hard to find and you can't be too picky. And maybe it's time for me to learn a little bit about repairing and diagnosing. I have all the equipment. I've got a gun for desoldering. I even have a microscope, but I like the skill. And if you have some video tips for me out there of learning how to repair them, there are many repair videos out there but they sort of, yeah, they just get on with the job. I really need to, to learn the basics, you know, uh, diagnosing what paths are not working, the voltage and so on. I've got a post card that you can insert into the ISA slot and into the PSI slot. It shows you uh, if there's any issues with the voltages, but that's as far as I get. And now I would love to hear from you. What is your opinion about the 486 platform for retro gaming? I have really fond memories. In fact, uh, the 486 was my very first custom built computer. So I have very fond memories, but now I want to hear from you. It is, yeah, Phil's Friday and I'm looking forward on Saturday, getting up in the morning, getting a cup of coffee, reading your comments and yeah, share your thoughts. What is your story about the 486? What system did you have? What games did you play? In this video, we didn't even get to play games. Um, this was quite time consuming. Um, so that's a bit of a shame, but look, there's always an opportunity for another video. And that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I shall see you soon with another one.